Okay, I, I am going to try to go very quickly through a bunch of slides. I was going to, I was going to take a much narrower uh, focus. I think we've had a, a lot of information here in terms of what the health impacts of climate change, and Catherine did an excellent job of going through various modalities in terms of policy, different types of energy choices we can make, et cetera. And I was going to just focus on the role of health professionals in particular as a, as a sector and changes that are occurring both at the level of individual physician and other health professional organizing as well as institutional work that's been going on that helps to support the sort of policy initiatives that Catherine and Wendy were addressing. So just to give a little uh, background on PSR's role on this, we have been uh, around for over 50 years and our basic motto here is that we are guided by the values and expertise of medicine and public health. We work to protect human life from the greatest threats to health and survival. Many of you here know about our work that's been since our inception, and we, which we continue in terms of combating the threats of nuclear weapons. But as, as much, we've been working for, since the early 1990s because of things like this we see in the in, uh, among our colleagues. And this is the Lancet weighing in a number of years ago. Climate change is the biggest global threat of the 21st century. The impact will be felt all around the world, not just in the distant future, but in our lifetime and those of our children, which gives us our charge as health professionals to take a very strong stand, particularly at a time when this has historically been so politicized and health is a real wedge issue for which we can speak up about. Uh, again, uh, our leaders such as Alexander Leaf, who was a, a, one of the founding members of PSR, took our organization in a new direction to expand beyond our work on nuclear weapons and nuclear power to deal with threats such as global climate change as well as toxic degradation in the environment. Throughout the 1990s and extending forward, we had a number of campaigns uh, as, as evinced here and my own state of California, for example, like many of our state chapters did, we issued reports such as Degrees of Danger, How Smarter Energy Choices Can Protect Our Health in California. So in a lot of ways, this is really old stuff that we're doing, but we have a particular import of stressing these issues now. We know that the public health effects of climate change are largely unaddressed. They include that it's happening now, the cost of an action are high, and a prevention approach is key for public health and safety, preparedness and response, and for community resiliency and recovery. All things that I think have been very well talked about by the other uh, speakers. And in terms of the renewed prominence, uh, you know, to many of us this is not such a new story, certainly events such as Hurricane Katrina in, in New Orleans, Hurricane Sandy here, have given new prominence to the particular role that health professionals can take. And this is uh, from last year, reflecting on, on the renewed emphasis on that in the wake of Hurricane Sandy. Rebranding climate change as a public health issue. This is in Forbes, and, and this is also in Forbes, that healthcare needs to lead the fight against climate change. And uh, Wendy spoke about Jeffrey Thompson, who is a very foresighted leader at Lutheran Medicine Hospital. And Gary Cohen on the left is the uh, CEO of Healthcare Without Harm. And this has represented a very dynamic movement within healthcare institutions, recognizing, as other people have spoken about, that it's that healthcare is a significant industry, it's a significant sector. If you get them to ch if this industry to change its, uh, its habits so that we can go beyond what the original Coalition of Healthcare Without Harm was doing in terms of reducing hospital-based pollution to actually move towards a variety of systematic change in terms of what type of energy do you use, what type of materials you use, et cetera, et cetera. We represent a big industry that can, that can lever, uh, give leverage to significant market changes on food and all other things that could benefit a healthy environment. And many of the healthcare institutions have joined this as other people have said, because they recognize just at the bottom line, not only is energy cost too much, et cetera, et cetera, but there's a recognition of the burden of chronic disease in healthcare institutions and the whole industry has to deal with. So a lot of the drivers on this are re referable to the, the co-benefits that concur on public and environmental health by making these changes. So we think the healthcare sector can play a key role in terms of encouraging green practices and the energy efficiency that we've talked about, provide materials to our patients and physicians alike to up the level 
of education and engagement, and also to make very concrete recommendations to hospital systems with that clinical voice that has such impact. And again, I, I gave a very brief focus on, on the work of Healthcare Without Harm that's been around for about 15 years, and which is really spearheading efforts like that. Our chapter in uh, San Francisco and many other uh, in, in our network around the country has been working in partnership with Practice Green Health and Healthcare Without Harm for many years, having concrete ways that we can reduce our imprint. This is like working on green teams. And not only does it you know, actually come up with sector changes that really make a difference, in my view, it allows us to intersect with a very busy health professional at the place where they work, because it's hard to get the engagement where people are so busy in our very dysfunctional healthcare system. Very prominent has been the Healthy Hospitals Initiative that uh, is, uh, has all of these major institutions that are currently bought in for the same uh, reason. The goal is to enroll 2,000 hospitals. It's free, all these materials and ways to change these hospital practices are free for those institutions that enroll in it. And this map gives a quick overview of hospitals that enroll. There's much more that needs to be done to make this effective and to really drive the changes that we need to see. As you can see on this slide, all of these aspects are dealt with within this type of systematic uh, sector report. So you engage your leadership at both the clinical and administrative levels uh, to uh, have less weight, waste, safer chemicals, healthier food, leaner energy, smarter purchasing. All of these things re mutually reinforce each other to make a major potential uh, change in it. Part of uh, driving this in terms of educational efforts among healthcare professionals has been what has been developed, a climate and health literacy consortium, so people get educated like all of you are here on these various issues. There are uh, slide presentations like this national webinar that I gave two years ago, climate change and the role of healthcare professionals. You can update these, you can add your own materials to it, so this is fresh and engages people with the newest information. And you can see, we've been able to mainstream this stuff by all of these organizations that have supported it. I know for myself, 15 years ago, when I was trying to give climate change grant, uh, to talk about climate change on Grand Rounds, the big hospital types of, of fora, you couldn't get in. This was too political. Having all of these organizations, CDC American, Nurses Association American, Medical Association, support materials like this, gets a lot of credibility among rather conservative health professionals. So what role do we have overall to stand up at a time when this whole issue has been so politicized and in this case we're hoping that people will trust their doctors and other health professionals. So these are some of the things you want to inform, educate, and engage, lead by example personally and professionally, advocate for development and implementation of policies across the uh, the state, local, and federal levels, engage decision makers, and get information out to our colleagues and networks, collaborate with professionals outside of our sector. One of the ways that I know from my own personal experience and some other PSR chapters is to be engaged at the level of the County Medical Association. Again, these are people in your own community, if you're a health professional, or in local public health associations that you could work together to make this change. We in San Francisco have had developed a very wonderful relationship with the San Francisco Medical Society, for example, that now there have been three or four issues such as this that are targeted towards health professionals that go through the gamut of positive change that you can make on energy, healthy food systems, et cetera. So for example, again, going to mainstream physicians in San Francisco, Climate Change for the Better, Linda Birnbaum and John Belvis. And we've worked at the level of policy food and chemical policy, but I just wanted to profile a number of the resolutions that we've got in climate change in human health, air pollution, and one on hydraulic fracturing last year that, again, ups the level of conversation and allows these organizations to actually speak out. So again, American Medical Association, American Nurses Association, and the APHA, the largest and oldest public health association in, in, in the world, are all speaking on this. And this has real consequences. So AMA, of all places, sent a, sent a letter to President Obama in 2009 urging him to take the strongest possible steps in Copenhagen. And he obviously didn't go for that, but no, nonetheless, it illustrates the potential. Here is a major AMA and APHA getting together. So these are incipient steps that forge a very broad and, and strong coalition. We've uh, 
at PSR. A number of us have gotten, for example, articles into the medical literature. Cindy Parker is the co-chair of our Environmental Health Committee, authored Slowing Global Warming, Benefits for Patient and the Planet, to make this case to the American family physicians uh, all around. These are thousands of uh, physicians who read this. She came up with very clear guidelines that you can go over with your patients in the damn 15 minutes that people normally have. But these are real things. How do you come up with the best recommendations to make those changes? In this case, she concentrated on food. And I commented on how much as what I'm talking about here relates to engagement at the hospital levels. Uh, other issues that relate to it, they're not strictly climate change as, as such, but another major issue profiled various issues of chemical policy and other pollutions that of course are associated with fossil fuel use in terms of the chemical industry, but it's another way to organize physicians who are more organized on chemical policy, say. We have been working for 10 years in partnership with the American Academy of Pediatrics, with, which is the Pediatric Environmental Health Toolkit, to train pediatricians. We offer credits for it, and this is a way that they up their level of being able to talk to their patients about lead and mercury and a whole host of other issues. My own program and the uh, program on reproductive health in the environment that I'm director of health professional outreach and education for at UCSF uh, in San Francisco is another way that we've been able to get this word out as well as related climate change issues to our fellow physicians, particularly the OBGYN community, with materials like this, which up the level of discourse, engage the physicians and get them working on policy. A very profound thing in terms of bolstering our ranks was a committee opinion that we worked on with the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, who up until this point, the 56,000 OBGYNs in this country never discussed environmental health issues, unlike the pediatricians. With this committee opinion, which forms the basis of clinical practice, now these members have to, I mean, to really be in line with their organization. When they see a patient, they have to frame their clinical approach with environmental health. And, and the basis of this, also the, the supporting papers for this document also dealt with the impacts of climate change as well. And as a result of that, ACOG and the American Academy of Pediatrics joined in letters to Congress to, this year uh, who are concerned about um, chemical policy to make a real impact and having health protective chemical policy. Again, this is a, a, a way to get these professionals involved in a whole range of environmental health issues. I wanted to close with just some remarks about the extraordinary work that's been going on here in New York State with concerned health professionals in New York. I participated in a panel a few months ago with Sandra Steingraber and others in San Francisco on the release of this compendium of medical and health effects associated with fracking, which would certainly overlap with the chemical toxicant issues that I was talking about just a moment ago because of the toxicity that the, the materials involved in fracking represent. One of the things that came out, which is extremely important, is a case that these health professionals made for a comprehensive health impact assessment. That is Larissa Deriska, who works here in New York State, has done a multiple PowerPoints and she's traveled all over the country. Talk about, when we're talking about whether it's climate change or fracking operations, you have to look at the whole life cycle of these, these practices and the impact on public and environmental health. And their organizing has been terrific. They engage all of these county medical societies in New York State, as well as uh, chapters of American Academy of Pediatrics itself, to, to form a very broad coalition that has led to, at this point, at least, the, the blocking of moving ahead with fracking operations in New York State. I'll just close and recapitulate a little bit what Catherine was saying. We have additional information, including what some of what I just mentioned, in terms of our web page about hydraulic fracturing with a number of uh, educational materials, brochures, uh, whatever, guides to doing uh, op-eds that anybody who wants to very easily weigh in has that ability to do. And the last thing, again, recapitulating what uh, Catherine said, the real import, although we understand it's not perfect, to weigh in on the EPA rule. And again, to underscore what Catherine said, even though it's not specifically uh, dealing with things like natural gas and fracking operations and methane, you could weigh in and you should be able to tell them you have to concentrate on all of these things because we need a healthy planet and that's what it's all about. 
Margaret Chan in 2007, the Director General of the World Health Organization, said the health sector must add its voice loud and clear. We must fight to place health issues at the center of the climate agenda, etc. Just a few days ago, representative of, of how slow things are really moving and underscoring the real import of what we do, she said, and how climate change can rattle the foundations of public health. Here's my strong view. Climate change and all of its dire consequences for health should be at center stage right now whenever talk turns to the future of human civilization. After all, that's what's at stake. And I just put that charge to all of you, whether you're health professionals or not, we really need to take the boldest possible stands on this. And I, in my own view, as many of the discussions have been going on here today, very integrated with other things that PSR is working on in terms of nuclear weapons and militarism, they're all part of the same piece, and I, join, I invite you to join our work at PSR to be able to deal with all of those issues. Thank you.